begin our look at sports out at the Brickyard, an eerily empty Indianapolis Motor Speedway for the greatest spectacle at racing Sunday. No Andretti in victory lane, no triple crown for Alonzo, no second victory for Rossi, but we did see some history. Takuma Sato snatched a second Indianapolis 500 victory and perhaps an unsatisfying finish, although a memorable one. Sato held off Scott Dixon and won under caution after a crash with five laps remaining in front of empty grandstands for the first time in 104 runnings because of the coronavirus pandemic. We caught up with Sato to ask him about the unique 500. Every time I tell people about IMS, I describe how massive the place is. Does it seem even bigger without having the fans as a race driver when you're turning laps? Um, you know, we just uh, simply just experienced at the moment, you know, without the fans at IMS which clearly sad, you know. I mean, it's not a happy place, of course not, but at least racing, I don't think any angle, any matter, you know, with or without fan, to be honest, in terms of competition level. Even we don't have a fan here physically, we know their heart is here. So I think every driver did 100% for the commitment, and uh, this was a result of a great race, I believe. The five-time IndyCar champion Dixon dominated the race and was disappointed, of course, but gave credit to Sato's drive in the final laps. Definitely hard to swallow for, for the team. Um, you know, massive thank you to, to the nine-car crew. They did a tremendous job on pit road today and, and strategy and everybody, did the, you know, everything we could. And, you know, uh, got to say congrats to Sato too. He, uh, he drove a hell of a race and, and uh, they were victorious and he's drinking milk and that's what counts. The winning team's car owners include a former 500 winner himself and a longtime late night TV host too. Here's Bobby Rahal, whose son Graham finished third behind Sato and Dixon on the podium and an ecstatic David Letterman. He said, or, you know, made, made the commitment uh, to, um, strengthen our engineering group and, and uh, make the investments in, in uh, R&D. And I think this, uh, this month here in August at, at Indy, I think it showed it with qualifying. And then, of course, today in the race, uh, having two cars in the top three. Letterman is from Indiana, went to Ball State, and was actually a weatherman who at one point covered the Indy 500 before becoming a household name on your TVs late night. And somebody said to me this morning, at the end of the Indianapolis 500, Takuma Sada and uh, Scott Dixon and Graham Rahal would be racing for the lead. I would say, well, that's, that's a dream. That's a dream come true. And uh, it, I woke up and it turned out that we won the Indianapolis 500. For us, you know, it's like we've been struck by lightning. Sato is certainly a household name in racing these days. The Japanese driver now has two Indy 500s to his credit since becoming the first Asian driver to win the coveted race in 2017. The race to the finish of the baseball season is on. Less than 40 games to go. The Bronx Bombers have cooled a bit. They are playing slightly above 500 baseball over their last 10 games. The New York Mets COVID-19 cases disrupted their schedule to the tune of three doubleheaders in five days. Now that's a lost Subway series in many ways. The expectations around here for this, this group and these guys and their terrific attitude doesn't change no matter what circumstances were put in or, um, you know, whatever adversity kind of comes our way or injuries come our way, you know, you know, we expect to go out and perform and perform well. Um, you know, that's the expectation in that room and it'll continue to be even as we navigate through a tough stretch. The pinstripers will be busy during these last few days before the August 31st trade deadline at 4 p.m. The club has a pitching problem with only ace Garrett Cole performing as expected. The Yanks are missing key pitchers Luis Severino, who had Tommy John surgery, and last year's best pitcher, Domingo Herman, who is serving out the remainder of his suspension. James Paxton recently went on the IL with a forearm flexor problem and won't return to the rotation until a week or two before the end of the regular season. Across town, the Mets are under 500 and dealing with more than just regular injuries, as we mentioned with the news of the COVID cases in their organization. We caught up with the GM and manager in our weekly Mets report. 
what we're all learning is that this virus continues to have a lot more questions for us than, than answers. But, uh, you know, we, we do feel comfortable that, that the spread has not, uh, has not come from player to player or coach to coach. At this point, you know, our best guess is that it came from, from some outside, outside spot, but, but that is simply that. It's a guess. And uh, at this point, we just don't, don't know and we may never know. We've got our first no-no of the 2020 baseball season for the 19th time in franchise history. A Chicago White Sox pitcher has thrown a no-hitter. This time around, it was the staff ace, Lucas Giolito, taking down the Pittsburgh Pirates in a 4-0 victory. It is his first career no-hitter. Giolito walked one, preventing him from the much more elusive perfect game. He wasn't just dominant in preventing hits, he was missing bats all night long. He ended up with 13 strikeouts while getting six ground ball outs and five fly ball outs. He got 30, that's right, 30 swing and miss strikes. Congrats to him on a terrific no-hitter. On the gridiron, the Jets are looking good in camp, having fun and building chemistry on and off the field. Um, I think the sky's the limit, you know. Um, it starts with the guys up front, you know. I think um, over the course of camp, each and every day, they've been getting better and grinding and, you know, staying in their playbooks and being, being sharp with their assignments. Um, so it really starts with those guys up front, um, obviously getting the runs called and getting us in the right run calls, and it's a whole total team thing. So um, obviously as runners, we got to do our job and run hard. Um, receivers got to get on the edge and block. You know, so as a as a run group, it's just going to be a total team effort. 24-year-old tight end Chris Herndon is embracing the moment. He has a fresh start and says he has come back to Florham Park a changed man following injuries and violating the league's policy on substance abuse. I kind of just want to get back out there, get back to having fun and, you know, being that reliable teammate, reliable source on the field for, you know, the team and showing that I could be, you know, consistent with that and just, you know, continue to do what I do and just most importantly, you know, don't take any steps back. Continue to find a way to get, you know, even 1% better every day. After several attempts to dwindle down the capacity, the decision has finally been made to hold this year's Kentucky Derby without fans. Churchill Downs made the announcement to reverse course, citing the increasing COVID-19 cases in the area. It will be the second Triple Crown race this year without spectators following the Belmont Stakes in June. The Kentucky Derby will be run on Saturday, September 5th. August 24th was Kobe Bryant Day. The Lakers paid tribute to their fallen star with a playoff win inside the NBA bubble. Bryant's legacy was celebrated and pays homage to the two numbers, 8 and 24, that Bryant wore throughout his NBA career. Both of the jersey numbers have been retired by the Lakers. In response to the Wisconsin police shooting of 29-year-old black man Jacob Blake, players from the NBA, WNBA, and MLB boycotted games this week, calling for an end to systemic racism. Queens Hoops legend turned broadcaster Kenny Smith walked off the live set at TNT and summed it up best. He says, as a black man, as a former player, I think it's best for me to support the players and not be here tonight. Those are the headlines. We hit the C-list for a tip of the cap to the aisles this postseason. Who says winning doesn't bring people out, even if they can't come out? The New York Islanders' playoff run is helping boost season ticket sales for their new arena. Scheduled to open next year, the Isles beat the Florida Panthers in the qualifying round, then advance past the Washington Capitals in the first round, then top the Philadelphia Flyers in the first game of the Eastern Conference semifinals. New York reports 80% of its season tickets for the 2021-2022 season. The inaugural season at UBS Arena at Belmont Park has already been sold. The team says it has sold nearly 10,000 full season tickets for UBS Arena's first season, winning puts fans in the seats. Really nice showing by the Islanders so far this postseason. Let's hope they keep it rolling, and let's hope we get to see all those fans at the new arena next year. Keep social distancing and washing your hands so we can make a Stanley Cup run with fans a reality. That's your look at sports. I'm Bobby C.